Here's your host, Jeff Frick. Hi, Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are on the ground in Seattle, Washington for uh, really a great tech week here. We wanted to bring theCUBE up, get a feel for what's going on. LinuxCon, DockerCon, OpenStack Seattle. Seemed like everything that was going on this week in tech was going on in Seattle. And we wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to come out and see Blue Box, Jesse Proudman, a visit right in the in ground central of what's going on in Seattle. So thanks for having us out. Our pleasure to have you. So absolutely. So. It's pretty interesting because this is kind of where cloud started. Arguably, you know, kind of AWS really popularized the, the idea of cloud computing uh, as an outsourced provider to enterprises through kind of the adoption of, of shadow IT. We've got Microsoft Azure here. Satya is, you know, rebuilding Microsoft around cloud and, you know, Office 365. So this is really kind of cloud central. And then here you guys are, a successful startup recently um, acquired by IBM. Congratulations. So is Seattle Ground central for cloud? Yeah, absolutely. Seattle has been and will continue to be cloud city. Uh, you've got every company that's doing anything in the infrastructure space and, and really the SaaS space has a presence here. So Amazon, Azure, Google, CenturyLink, IBM now, we're, we're all here. And I think it creates a very interesting sort of vortex of talent, of expertise, of, of experience sharing. Um, and we were really excited as Blue Box to be based here and then now part of IBM. Uh, being able to to really establish a foothold, a presence for IBM Cloud uh, in Seattle, we'll be doing some some pretty great stuff over the next year. That's great. And what's interesting about you guys coming, obviously, you're built on OpenStack, a big part of your story, but you still now offer, you know, a choice of clouds, right? For people, they can have an in-prem, in off-prem. You know, there isn't there isn't one cloud solution that's appropriate for every workload, right? There's a variety out there, and you you guys kind of come at it from from a variety based on, you know, kind of an open source underpinning. Yeah, so I, I think one of the coolest experiences about going through the M&A process was being able to go sit down and talk with many of the giant enterprise uh, providers of OpenStack. So sort of if you look at the sponsor list, we got to talk to a lot of the, those organizations. And the IBM cloud strategy really resonated with us. So it's this public, dedicated, local model where the locale of the cloud really is irrelevant. What we're delivering is an experience. We're delivering an API and an SLA uh, and whether that sits on premises at a customer site or is a dedicated private cloud in a software facility or ultimately is an OpenStack based public cloud, uh, having that consistent experience and that consistent API across all three is, is really key. And, and IBM is putting significant energy and resources behind delivering on that, that vision. Yeah, and I remember that was really a big part of your talk at OpenStack Silicon Valley last year when, when we had you on talking about, you know, why are we spending so much time talking about the nuts and bolts and the pain of putting this stuff in when really the focus should be on the user experience and they don't really care. They just want it to work it again. It needs to work. Credit to, credit to AWS for really resetting expectations for what people think should be available on, you know, basically dialing it up, turn it on, log in and go. Yep. And that's been successful for yeah, you. Yeah, and I think that's that's been the OpenStack challenge, right? So many of the conversations have been, why don't we see more adoption? Well, it didn't work for the first couple of years and to the extent that an enterprise needed it to work. Right. We finally crossed that gamut, but then the experience of a distribution versus as a delivery as a service wasn't driving that that experience that customers were looking for. And so I think we've finally crossed that gamut. Now there's there's companies like Blue Box and Platform 9 and, and MetaCloud Cisco um, that are able to deliver this capability as that experience regardless of the location. And this is where I, I think we'll start to see more and more of those enterprise use cases and, and more widespread adoption outside of just technology companies. Yeah, so dig into that a little deeper because you gave a presentation this morning at, at the OpenStack Scale event about really the death of the distro. I wonder if you can dive into that a little bit. You know, what was kind of your point of view? Why, why are you uh, taking, that, taking that stance? Yeah, so part of that was just watching as an observer for the last couple years. Uh, and then the other part is watching as a, a service provider for the last couple years. So if we go talk to customers and prospects, the reality is that software distributions today, they've worked phenomenally well for things like Linux or things like MySQL or small, smaller sort of single server installations. But when you think about cloud, you're no longer talking about a single, a single server as the unit of measurement. You're not talking about one Linux distribution. You're talking about hundreds of interconnected servers and interconnected sets of software. And so being able to ship, uh, ship OpenStack as a software distribution, yes, that works. You can get everything up and running easily. We, we got a cool demo from Canonical this morning with them doing that. But the reality is that things go wrong. The operations burden of OpenStack, the operations burden of a distributed system, uh, that falls on the shoulder of the, the software distribution user, and that's the big challenge. And, and whereas uh, with, with Linux or with a, a database, when you have sort of one system go down, you have an isolated area of failure, 
when you're using a cloud for your production applications and that cloud goes down, you've lost everything. Uh, so the, the, we call it the blast radius, right? The blast radius has gone up dramatically. And so working with a service provider who has a network effect of hundreds or thousands of installations who can learn from each one of those installations and you can push those changes out and updates and upgrades uh, and learnings back out into that network of, of installations, that's the way customers will be successful using OpenStack, not as raw software. Right, right. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about, you know, you liquidity event, now part of IBM, um, but you guys have a real distinctive culture, really driven a lot by you. You're the face of the company, you're out there a lot. You have a great sense of, uh, of humor and really kind of represent well. Now you're part of IBM, right? So it's goodness, you've got, you've got resources that you never had before in terms of sales, distribution, smart people, distinguished engineers, et cetera. But, but you're also now part of a bigger, bigger family, 400,000 people now, 400,060. Um, how's that changing the culture? How are you kind of managing that uh, as well as taking advantage now of the increased distribution and resources that, that you can bring to bear? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's one that hits any startup that goes through an acquisition into a larger company. We certainly watched MetaCloud go through that experience uh, almost a year ago That's now right. and, and good friends with a number of folks over there. So it certainly had a lot of learning uh, that we were able to do from, from that team. You know, I think at the end of the day, IBM, when they came to us, they said, look, there's a lot of things you guys are doing very, very well, um, and there's a lot of things we think that we can bring to the table. And so our job collectively is how do we, how do we capture the benefit of both organizations and make sure that the sum is better than the parts. Uh, and so culture was a big part of, of what they thought we did, we did right. And what we were able to build with 65 people um, was, was pretty phenomenal. But matching that up, as you mentioned, with the brand, with the distribution, with the sales force, and with the technical expertise, that's really critical. Uh, IBM has a really unique position of understanding enterprise requirements. They know what these buyers want. They know what the buyers need, uh, and they have that, those long, deep-seated relationships. And so bringing that together with technology innovation, a much faster development cycle, uh, a, an offering that gets customers in at, at the ground floor and, uh, from a price point perspective and grows with them as the customer grows, we're able to blend all of those things together into to one really compelling offering. And that's what we're most excited about. I, th I think we are uniquely positioned in terms of open stack acquisitions that have happened in the last 18 months to really leverage that, that acquirer uh, to do so much more as a combined entity versus kind of just being folded in and, and disappearing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not worried about you being folded and disappearing. That's not your style. <laughs> uh, but I don't want to shift gears because it's a, it's a cultural thing, but um, anyone who pays attention to you sees it. It shouldn't be hard to see. And that's race cars and cars. You're, you're a race car fan. Yeah. What is that all about in terms of, and, and what lessons do you take from obviously that outside of work uh, and that experience into work? Why is that important to you and, and how do you leverage it? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I've been a huge car fanatic for years uh, since I was in, in high school and uh, have, have always had that racing hobby. Uh, I think as an entrepreneur, so much of your sort of your personal day and your personal identity is wrapped up in your business. And um, I found myself sort of stuck around the clock thinking about work. Um, and what we were going to do next and what technology we could build and how we were going to close that next deal. And um, you put yourself in a race car and you get it on the racetrack and that goes away. Sort of it's this, um, it's this own unique sort of Zen experience where all you're thinking about is, is driving that car and um, sort of the mechanical connection to, to something physical. Uh, it's, it's so different from what we do digitally uh, that it, it really became this interesting release, this interesting uh, place to find sort of some, some sense of calm um, and, and some sense of that physical, tangible world. We live in, in uh, IT and cloud. We live in, in something that you never really touch uh, and, and be able to go to the racetrack and touch the cars and work on the cars and experience that being so fundamentally different from what we do on a day-to-day -day basis has been just a, a phenomenal uh, part of my life. Yeah, I, I, can, I can imagine just the concentration. Just You, just, there, you cannot let anything uh, enter your mind, I'm exactly. sure, once you're uh, focused on that track. Another cultural thing, so we're happy to be here. You guys have signs and posters and trophies all over the place, which is very, very cool. But we also have, we, we, we have the gong here. So what's, what's the story here on the gong? Yeah, it's our gong. So we have a, a big culture around winning and uh, the sales team is critically important to us. And I think oftentimes in many organizations, the sales team sort of is, is off in the corner and uh, certainly they're closing deals, but uh, it's, it's often difficult for pieces of the organization to see and to feel the success of, of each individual team. So it's easy to share sort of a product release and all the features that were added. Um, easy to share kind of what marketing has been doing because it's all public, but this, the sales team 
often misses out on that. And so we added the gong every time we close a deal, that, that gong gets rang. Uh, some people love it. I think we've, we've almost started heart attacks a couple times. <laughs> I, uh, I am a notorious loud gong ringer myself. Uh, so we when we closed the deal, the M&A transaction, we did a, a pretty wild gong ringing uh, <laughs> as well. But uh, yeah, it's, it's now become sort of this, this loved and hated uh, part of the culture, uh, depending on who you ask here. Can't hate the gong. Come on, who hates the <laughs> gong? I mean, we're selling business. Obviously, the people that hate the gong haven't been in startups that, that have not had this uh, kind of a successful transition liquidity the, event. That was the, the word I was looking for before. It's always a you know nice liquidity event. It's the auditory assault, I think, that they're uh, they're most concerned about. Absolutely. So I can give you the last word here before, before we check out. What you've, you've gone through the acquisition. I'm sure there was a lot of stress and and things going on up until that point. We've got through that. We're kind of in the OpenStack season. We're at, at OpenStack Summit in Vancouver. Here this week, we're at OpenStack uh, Silicon Valley next week. What's kind of your short-term kind of objectives? What are you doing over the next six months that you can share that yeah. you're excited about? Yeah, great question. So the first two months after the acquisition were really integration, getting the, the teams, the engineers, the employees.